Another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Today's story, Timber Cruisers. Hello there. We've dealt with many types of men in reading from the pages of our scrapbook. Seafaring men, community leaders, promoters, rowdies, town characters, athletes, and industrialists. And tonight we have opened the scrapbook to a page that tells of one of Grace Harbor's most select fraternities, the tight-knit couture of timber cruisers whose marks on the tall and uncut timber of Grays Harbor's backlands where the, where the timbermen's trails through the country and whose knowledge of our wilderness went far in blazing the trails for future progress. It's not one man that we're going to talk about, but many. Such men as Watt Pebbles, Ben Kesterson, Jim Et Emphy, Willis Hopkins, Jerry McGillicuddy, and of course others whose Jacob's staff have parted the brush on a thousand wooded hillsides of our county and whose compasses have charted the section lines for the cedars of Tahola to the firs of the Strawberry Hill. So, when Dick has had a few words from our sponsor, we'll be back with the yarn of the timber cruisers, the old and the new, who have hiked the woods of Grays Harbor to leave their mark on the finest timber in the world and to provide us with a page in our hometown scrapbook. The stories are gone. Out of the tall timber from the last times have stalked the legendary cruisers who whacked the endless forest of Grays Harbor County up into the claim-sized packages toted the board footage of a hundred million trees and learned the pathless woodlands of our country as none others have ever known them. But behind them are their stories and legends, the tales of men who weighed and measured the great firs, the hemlock stands of our rainforest, and jotted their tally books with the first notes of the harvest of the greatest commercial forest on the face of the earth. There were not many in their select company, that, but they have not been forgotten, nor is their prowess of pacing off section lines and calibrating their minds to the diameter of a butt log apt, apt to every take a back page in the books of our history. But to tell their story, we must deal with them as individuals, for certainly no contour of tradesmen were ever more the individuals than these timber cruisers of Grays Harbor. Take old Ben Kesterson, for example. He blazed the corners of almost every stand of timber that the Schaefer brothers ever put an axe to, and he knew the woods of the East County like you know the palm of your own hand. It was 1877 when young Ben Kesterson, Hale, and a man at 21, came north from California. He was a hankering for survey work and he arrived on the ground just ahead of the big timber rush that saw eastern interests staking out claims to the endless stands of fur that grew on our coast. It was his blaze that marked the section corners of countless surveys for the peninsula or Pennsylvania timber buyers before there were such places as Hoquim or Aberdeen, and when the only sound of saw bits through timber in the whole country came from the low-pitched champing of a teeth biting into white fur of the old water-powered mill at Cosmopolis. Ben Kesterson was an experienced logger before the Pioneer Schaefer Brothers firm began to slick the timber off the hills or out of the valleys of the Satsop and Winucci. It was his timber lore that was the guarantee for the young loggers venturing into the new business. For old Ben was hired as key man for their logging show, and he cruised acreages for the Schaefers from their first purchase until 
they took the Forest Service timber. And then it was Ben's son Ed who chipped the bark for the blazes and paste-off sections. A tall, gaunt man in his prime, Ben ranged the uncut for half a century, sleeping in the woods, remaining away from civilization for weeks on end. In his lonely jaunts, the scale of stand of fur, he had fallen off cliffs three times and was nearly drowned. And to his last days, this indestructible Daniel Boone of a harbor forest life lived with his wife in a small, neat cottage on the banks of the Satsop that he loved so well and to which he directly, directly in 1877 when he moved from North California. In his days as timber cruiser stepping off the yards estimating the stand, Ben Kesterson developed some fixed ideas about the timberlands of Grace Harbor. We'll never need to worry about a timber famine, he told people. The stuff grows too fast on Grace Harbor. Just keep fire out of it, and nature will put new timber back onto our hills faster than any other place on earth. We'll never have the big timber again, he opinioned, but we'll have plenty, plenty of good word for all of our needs. There was W.G. Watt Peebles, who lived out a long life in Hoquiam. Watt had overthrown a dream of becoming a stock raiser in Nebraska when he came to Grace Harbor in 1885. He had left his native Wisconsin in 1884 to settle in the Prairie State, but there was too much sand blowing around for him, and he kept right on going to New Mexico and later to San Francisco, where he landed in September 1884. From there, his Wisconsin sawdust background sent him to Eureka and to Grace Harbor. Levitt and Clemson were loggers on the Deslin Creek in the eastern end of the country. county. Watt got on, and from that day forward, they made the tall and uncut his business. He became he began to cruise the stuff after he helped the late O.P. Burroughs cruise the stand for the Northwestern Lumber Company. It was sort of an apprenticeship, and it took him three years to get enough of it lined up to make it a paying position. But about 1910, he began to make timber cruising a full-time effort. Watt used this to sum up a man's requirement for the job like this. He has to know something about timber and terrain. He ought to have legs like a sprinter and a constitution like a bear. Then he's got to have to stake out a lot of his ability to guess and to count up to 2,000. That's the number of pieces along a section line, as Watt reckoned them. And if you knew Watt Peebles, you recall that he qualified on all accounts. And he reckoned that his long suit was guessing. When he gave up the business and took a back glance at the 40 years that he had spent tallying timber, he found that he had filled 50 tally books, and in each was the timber record of 36 complete sections, all or parts cruised by himself. His records covered most of the big timber stands in the Grays Harbor, Willapa Harbor area. He also had noted on where a cruising man could make good time and where the devil was against him. The district between Hoquiam and Quinault was a cruiser's paradise, he often confided. Trees were uniform, underbrush not bad, and terrain pretty decent. And there were other notes about the worst of it. And that, what Peebles recalled, was along the coast within a few miles of the ocean. There the underbrush compri comprised with sand hill sloughs and bogs to make much of it nearly impossible to anyone but the experienced cruiser with true cruising attributes to navigate. Along the fog belt of the coast, things were pretty fair until the big blowdown of 1921. Since, there, since then, because of the interlaced mat of fallen trees, it's impossible to cruise. Watts was working in that county that January day when the big howler came roaring in from the sea and toppled billions of feet of fine timber. Clyde Jackson was his teammate, and a good one. 
They were working a stand on Widow Creek in Hump Tulips country when the big hurricane hit. The two hightailed it out of the woods in a hurry, and when they came back to the job the next day, they had to make their way over piles of logs as high as houses. It was about 1937 that Watt Peoples put aside his Jacob staff and compass, but he saved one of the finest timbers in America for the last cruise. It was in the area he worked at the North Fork of the Quinault Lake to Lunch Creek and miles of the surrounding territory. Like all cruisers, Wad had his particular mark that he axed on trees that he encountered on his cruise, and occasionally as a reference point. He always thought of Jerry McGillicuddy, the old-time timber cruiser, when he recalled the blaze that had hacked on a million trees. For when Wad began his cruising, McGillicuddy was about through with his, and Wad adopted Jerry's mark over the protest of older cruisers. McGillicuddy had a proud boast that he had more marks in the woods of the Pacific Northwest than any other cruiser, and Watts always agreed. I helped them there, he used to say, as he put a cut on more marks than any other blaze in western timber. It was along the slash with four notches. Most of the old cruisers, Watt Peebles, had a great affection for animals, birds, and forests. The life of a timber cruiser being what it was, these wild creatures were the only available companions on the cruise that might last for several days. He once said, if it wasn't for the elk, he wouldn't have been able to cruise some of the timber on the peninsula. The elk browsed down the foliage in the underneath, opened trail through the grove and kept them open. These trails were used by early cruisers to chart their paths into the rainforest. However, all of these animals' experiences were not very pleasurable. Watt Peebles was once trapped on Andrews Creek near Elk River by a bear who thought he was molesting her cubs. Watt and a compass man along with him for this time, the two of them spent hours in the spruce. But Ben Kersterson and Watts' people were only two of the rugged breed that knew the hills and valleys of the wood and black back of the wood backlands like you know the palm of your hand, and who rolled up their blankets before the pitch fire with a cushion of fur needles and a pillow for moss. And moss for a pillow. There were the there were more than the reading of their names. It's like a roll call of the men of the forest for they were the pioneer woodsmen who went ahead. And after Dick Crombie has said a few words from our sponsor, we'll be back with more about the timber cruisers. Yes, those old timber cruisers were a sort of deep woods royalty in the big tree country, and each had their own special mark that they left hewn in the bark of a tree. Jim Emphy had what he called his coonskin mark, that can still be seen on many stands of old growth that mark the corner of one of the Ambeline Jim surveys. Lem Nethery chipped a diamond when he marked a tree, and John Markham cut what is called a big mitt. A cruiser by, by the name of Holland always used an intricate blaze that took a half an hour of intricate work to hack into a tree. It was called the lizard, and, if nothing else, was never duplicated so far as any old-timers can recall, probably because nobody ever wanted to spend that much time on a mark. The swastika was a common marking of old-time cruisers, and some of them just slashed a smooth blaze or wrote their name in the clean wood with a heavy crayon. Timber cruising is still a pretty highly skilled business, and its traditions have been handed down by men who are capable of carrying on the pace and the, and the records of the old-timers. But the records of the old-timers, factual records we mean, don't often match up. Marks and blazes are often easy to find compared with following some of the old compass courses. Old cruisers tell us it's because the needle doesn't always point true north in this part of the world and changes over the years. And the old courses and the old reference points 
aren't where the needle says they should be today. But that's the way it is. Few timberlands of the world tossed out the challenge to men to come and guess their stands and did those of the rainforest and the men who took challenge with a superior race of the forest ferrets who have just justly deserved their place tonight in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.